introduction like that, I can just let her up and make the talk. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank you all for having me here. And I never dreamed that I would be here. And um, it's a great honor for me that I feel honored for you all asking me to come and be with you tonight. And it's like every, you know, I have, say, 45 minutes to talk. And we want to have some questions if you have at the end. And I, uh, I appreciate the time, too, because sometimes they only give me 30 minutes and I have to hurry up and talk fast. And Can you hear me back there? Yes, sir. All the way back? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, she told you that I was 16 and I was, um, you know, all 16-year-olds that I've had anything to do with, most of them, not all of them, they think they're just so smart. They think their parents are just dumb, plain dumb. And I've gotten to that point. I had, at the age of 13, I went to the altar and gave myself to God. But at the age of 15, I thought I was smarter than God was. <laughs> you know how that goes. I don't know whether any of you will admit it or not, but anyway, that's where it went with me. And uh, my girlfriend that I, uh, the girl that I'd known all the way through school from first grade up, and I had talked about what we were going to do when we got married and all that kind of stuff. Well, when I didn't, I could, didn't take, couldn't take her to the prom because my dad gave me the car and the car was empty with gas. And I asked him for a little bit of money. I'd been working for him all the time and I asked him if he would give me some money to buy gas. He said, go drain it out of your motorcycle. You can get that motorcycle in the road all the time. So it's nothing, uh, so you just go and get it out of there. I had to go at 3 o'clock in the afternoon until I couldn't take her to the prom. And she got mad with me and started dating another guy. Oh. So July the 3rd, I know, July the 2nd, she told, 1941, she told me she was going to see his family for thanks, I mean, for the 4th of July celebration. Now, in Alabama, I don't know what it is here in Virginia, but in Alabama, when some girl or boy went to meet, the family, that was an invitation to get married, I thought. So I asked her to go out and go to the show with me. Well, she said she'd go on the 2nd, it was the night of the 2nd of, of um, July. We never made it to the show, we made it to a park and so then I started talking and kissing and crying. And we were there until 3 o'clock in the morning kissing and crying. <laughs> she said, I will not go, I'll tell my mother I'm not going. So I, I took her home at 3 o'clock in the morning and. Her mother was on the porch, but I thought she had a gun, but she had a broom. And I said, I said, Lois says she wasn't going. She says she's not going to make a commitment and break it. Now you get out of here before I hit you with this broom. So I was very upset. And I had all the problems with my mother and father. I thought there was big problems because they were trying to teach me something. So I got on my motorcycle and I went, I went back and the next morning I saw I got on a train so I went to Montgomery, which was a town close to where I was. I was from Fort Deposit, a little town south of Montgomery. And I uh, got in trouble with a honky-tonk guy. I went in there to have a drink of Coca-Cola and he came over there and he said, I told you guys from Lowndes County not to come up here by yourself. He said, those boys over there are going to give you a whipping. I don't need that around here. Get out of here. I said, well, I will the quicker I get through drinking my Coke. He grabbed my Coke and he said, you out of here now. So I went out, got on my motorcycle and started to the road. And a mad, mean streak hit me. And I turned that thing around, it was a big old Harley, and I turned that thing around. He had these swinging doors. And I took the right door off going in, knocked it up next to the bar, went through the chairs and the table, and got him back on that high-polished dance floor. And I made a figure eight on it, and the old motorcycle was smoking and everything. And then I got in the middle and made a streak, and I looked up, and there he comes out of the back with a shotgun. I said, oh, my gosh, I can't go to the Navy. I can't do that because they won't say, they won't sign and they know me. I said, all right. And I passed the Army recruiter. I said, this is it. I'm going in there. So I pulled up there on the motorcycle, got off, and walked up to the door, and the sergeant said, could I help you? And I said, yes. I want to join the Army. He said, how old are you? I said, 21. He said, you got to have your registration certificate. If you was 21, 1st of July, you had to register. I said, I don't have to have that thing. 
because this is my birthday. That was number one line. <laughs> I'm 21. And he said, well, he said, uh, uh, wait, uh, no, I said, and this is my birthday, and I just couldn't wait to get to my 21st birthday so I could speak for myself and get in the Army. So I volunteered for the Philippine Islands. And the reason for that, I wasn't running from any war or anything like I saw in that newspaper article. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to get as far away from that guy that honky talk as I could. <laughs> I thought he'd have to tread some water to get over to the Philippines. Anyway, I went to the Philippines. I left and uh, was there the first part of August, 1941. And like the recruiter said, it was a, la a paradise. It was pretty. And I enjoyed it. And we had, a, and a, there were seven hours in a group that went on and they got there at the same time for the same company. And I enjoyed it. And when, when we were there for about six days, this first sergeant came down. We had to sleep at uh, the Philippine Department because our air wing was out on maneuvers. So he came down and said, I've got a proposition for you, all of you. We need some men. We can't take the time to, to get them from the States. If you guys will switch over to us and sign a three-year contract, go to school six, uh, five and a half months, then we'll, uh, we'll go be, make you an audience officer, and a first or second lieutenant, whichever ones you grade, or what the best grades are. And he says, and you'll stay here three years, and then go back, and you're guaranteed OCS. Now here I was at 16 at that time, and I thought, man, that's the greatest deal I ever made. I do do that, so I did, we did. And we were, went to school and obeyed and got the rules and so forth and set, our, uh, set the date for December the 10th, 1941, to get our commission. And would you know, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor the morning of the 7th, and it was the 8th for us in uh, the Philippines, so that never happened. So when the war started, <laughs> My colonel in charge, a full bird colonel, called us in and gave each one of us an assignment. He gave me, put me in charge because, uh, because I had pretty high uh, study scores, and he put me in charge of the ammunition moving to and from the front lines. Man, I thought that was great. Put a guy by the name of Gerald Block as my assistant, and he assigned me 30. American soldiers out of our group. It was a rough detail. <clears throat> when you're going forward, it's all right, but when you're coming backwards, it gets to be rough if any of you in here have ever experienced that. But I don't know whether you have or not. Anyway, the Japanese came on the six hours after they hit Pearl Harbor on the 8th of December in the Philippines, and they bombed Clark Field, Nichols Field, Cavite, Manila, some of the places in Manila, and Cregador. We were out in, in Bataan on, on, at the time it hit. Our headquarters was at Fort Santiago in Manila, but we were out there. And we decided a bunch of us, when the, when the plane, we heard the Japanese planes coming, we would go to a clearance and stand there and watch them, because they came down to Manila Bay, I mean Manila Bay, right down from uh, Manila, and hit Cregador. And we stood there and watched the bombs fall and watched one of that Jap planes knocked out of there. And we and I realized that we was at war. While we was gone, I like to tell a little something funny, sort of was sort of interesting. Uh, Mess Sergeant Mahoney said, I'm gonna sit here and have a cup of coffee. I'm not going out there. You guys go on out there. So we got back and in front of Mahoney it was a little monkey about this high. And we, he was just sitting there. We said, where'd you get him? He said, well, I've had many first sergeants and, and, uh, uh, and drill sergeants nearly curse me out, nearly. But I never had it from a monkey. He said, that one, the bomb started falling, the monkey came out of the tree and jumped up here on this table and stood up there and just said, wang, 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 right at me. And he said, when they stopped, he said, no, he hadn't moved yet. I tried to touch him, he moved back. Well, we, we kept that little rascal because he became our radar 
He could hear the jet planes before we could, and before the sirens would go. So we named him Radar. And if you tried to beat him to the foxhole, you'd just out of luck. If the bombs were coming from this way, he'd be right over here where he was supposed to be. Coming that way, he'd be right over here. And so I, we left him when we did left. We left him for the Japanese, and I hope he, I hope he gave him some false information. But anyway. So we fought the Japanese 14th Army for four months. What happened is, is that they, after they bombed Pearl Harbor and they bombed us, 10 days later, a few stragglers came in, invaded. And then around the 20th or the 23rd, uh, the 14th Army, one of their best, came in and they were five to one stronger than we were. And they were, they were a lot of a lot of them had been in China, and they were seasoned fighters, and they were equipped, and they were they knew what they was after. Well, the USAF headquarters didn't let our planes get off the ground, and I, four days after that, I had to go to Clarkfield and Nicholsville with a convoy carrying about uh, seven truckloads of 500-pound bombs. To only find out that the bombs didn't have it, no airplane was there. They burned up some of the B-17s, and there, some of a few of them got away. But um, we had six hours that we could have gone and hit Formosa because the Japanese planes were going to come from Formosa and hit the Philippines at the same hour that they hit Pearl Harbor. But they had uh, they were socked in with weather. And we could have gone and bombed them on the ground, but we didn't. And they tore, they, we lost all of our P-40s, practically all of them, three or four or five maybe left. And all the ships at Kabiti Navy base was docked just like they were in, uh, in Pearl Harbor and destroyed. Well, this, was, this really concerned us and everything, but our job was to hold them until reinforcements could get there and also at the time, we didn't realize it, but what we did in four months, holding them back for well, their drive south, they had a timetable to take the Philippines in two months and then go and take Australia. Well, our, we held them for four months, and they didn't ever get to Australia. And the Americans didn't got there before they did. And MacArthur, we got, and MacArthur was able to get out, and if they had, uh, they, they had, tried to establish a beachhead at the end of the tan and cut us half in two. And if they had, they would have uh, taken us in 10 days. So we fought them every inch of the way and held them back. And at the end, we run out of food, we run out of most of gasoline, water to drink, good water, we run out of iodine to treat our water. And um, I'll say this right now, I've, no disrespect to the boys that was on out on Craigador, but USAF never gave us the boys on the front line one can of anything, not a can of salmon or not a can of anything. Because that rice was standing, there. and some of our rice was blown up about 70 miles away, and they they refused to let it come in there, and we were taken and MacArthur. It issued the order to General Wayne Wright to fast the fight to the last man, and uh, he told that to, uh, to uh, General King, and General King said, "Sir, if you and I are living when this is over with, I'll see you in military court because I'm on surrender tomorrow morning." They didn't know that he had a note from uh, General Homer. The Japanese general said, "I have the reinforcements to take you." And if you don't surrender in two days, I'm going to kill every living soul in Matan. And that would have been about 60 or 70, 65 or 70,000 men, American and Filipinos. And there were 38,000 old men, women, and children in there, and that would, have been, that would have been killed too. And he referenced it, Nan King, China. So he knew he meant it. So General King surrendered us. And we started shooting at, uh, the motors uh, out of the trucks and cars with armor-piercing rifles. We, did, we destroyed our big, uh, our big 
uh, stash, stash of uh, ammunition on top of the mountain up there, like a 4th of July, 4th of July celebration. And it, it, where they tried to establish a um, beachhead was we'll come in and, and uh, at the 1st of February at Agaloma Point and down at the Battle of the Points. And in the history books, they'll show the Battle of the Points, and we denied them that. And I got involved in that. In other words, I got there on the road. I was coming back from the China Sea area, and this major from Kansas stopped me, and he asked me, he said, what have you got up there in that warehouse that we can shoot down in here in that, on that beach? Cregador guns couldn't come in because they could come in on that side and hit, but they, that bullet couldn't come, that shell couldn't come in and make a hit. And hit they had that five, 500 foot uh, to protection of a bluff. So I said, where, where were you from? He said, Kansas. I said, you know what a hog trough looks like? And he said, what in the world does a hog trough have to do with this? And I said, well, you build, you got some of that old lumber over there, build a chute right like this, stick it out as far over the, uh, the bluff as you can, next to a tree. I have three, three warehouses full of 30-pound fragmentation bombs, and I'll go get them, and we'll slide them down on them. <laughs> and he said, you go get them, and I'll, have, I'll build the chutes. So I'll get back. He had seven chutes, and we slide, slid them down, and denied them of their uh, beachhead, and that was a thing that let, allowed us to go another month and a half, two months. And in the meantime, the Americans got to Australia, MacArthur got down there. So that set up, when the surrender came, that set up our, uh, we had to go and uh, report to a designated place. And I went to Mar Marbellus, which is the end of Patan, and I was one of the, we were, I was in one of the first groups to start marching, and it was on the night, afternoon, right, not dark, but close to darkness, uh, on the 9th of April, 1942. I marched 90 miles total, because I marched some before I got there, and I had no water, no sleep, no food or anything, just march. Now, I saw all of the atrocities that you can imagine, that you heard about. I saw them kill and behead them. I saw them uh, take the trucks and run into the line of where the marching troops and run over them. I saw them put their rifles with their bayonets fixed on outside on a, a, a flat bay, I mean a state body truck, and they hit the guys on the head or whatever. And I saw them burying them alive. I saw one. Filipino lady, there was throat was cut, her breast was cut, and her stomach was cut, laying in the middle of the road, and a baby was, a dead baby, was in the, in the stomach. And that's sort of horrible to say it and all, but that's the way they treated the Filipino people. But when I got to the, a certain point, um, I couldn't, I couldn't pick up my feet at the end. My tongue was starting to swell, and my throat was hurting. And I knew it was time, it wasn't very long, and I wouldn't be there. And if you stumbled and fell, they'd shoot you. If you reached and talked to you, help, tried to help your buddy, they'd shoot you. And we think, we think that what they did is when they came in there, they found all these sick guys in the hospital and the wounded and all, and the older guys, and they said, march them. Don't feed them anything. And when they, whoever makes them march, We'll make slave labels out of them. So I was captured by a, a, a country that we had no drilling or training at all about how to understand them. And I'll give you an example how bad it is sometimes talking through an interpreter. And this is sort of a humorous thing. I had a friend in Atlanta, Georgia, that went to Japan and talked to a business uh, a breakfast club, and he was talking through an interpreter. And he gets up and he says, good morning. And the interpreter said, oh, hi, son. And the guy said, I am tickled to death to be here to speak to you this morning. And the interpreter said, he scratches himself until he dies just to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's funny. It is funny. But on 
on the other hand, we had to, all had to do with emotions and uh, signals and trying to tell them what we wanted and what I, what we thought. And it got uh, most of the Americans that got hurt at the beginning sometimes did not understand what they had to do to get to communicate. And it was bad communication and a lot of the guys after we were captured were uh, killed or practically killed, beat to death nearly. On Tyler's road detail, I got my head busted. I lay for three days, approximately three days, nearly subconscious. And um, they, 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 they did a great deal. They put a band-aid on it. And uh, things like that. And you, it was nothing unusual for a Japanese guard to did not like you because you was a certain height, or, and particular red hair or something like that. And they just jump on your beach and nothing. <coughs> We, when we got to Osaka, we was, I was shipped to Osaka in 1942, and Osaka number one camp, they come in and then the guard would change every two weeks, and they had the guard that was fighting our Americans uh, at the front lines, and they come and send them home for R&R, &R, and instead of R&R, and &R, they'd make them uh, work while they were there. So they come and guard us seven or uh, two weeks at a time, each crew. And the first night, you had to watch out because it was not unusual for them to empty a barracks that we were in and beat everybody in it for nothing, just about 2 o'clock in the morning, and maybe kill one or two. It didn't matter. <coughs> they didn't have to have any, uh, any program or have to ask anybody to kill anybody in America. We were just the trash of the world. And in one, one instant, I was walking down the streets of Osaka, at about eight degrees that day. I'd worked all day. I cut my hand and it, it was so cold it wouldn't even bleed. I had my hands in my pocket and the guard told me to take my hands out of the pocket. And when I got in camp he, he reported me to the to the guard and uh, he the guard took me into the, the little old the hutch there they had a high office and the interpreter said you were walking down the streets of Osaka with your hands in pockets. Soldiers don't do that. I said, well, nobody told me I'm not really a soldier now. I'm a prisoner of war. And nobody told me it was against your rules to walk with your hands in your pocket when I'm about to freeze to death all day. And he said, uh, so he started arguing. I started, started arguing with him and telling him, well, if you tell, show me and tell me what I had to obey the orders, I could obey them. But I'm not. Some of you can't even, you can't even like you see, you accuse me now, and, and I, I didn't do myself any good because a major was sitting over there, and he beat his fist on the desk and said, take him outside. And the interpreter said, he's going to execute you just to show the rest of them that you've got to obey orders. So they rounded up all the POWs and had them out there, and I walked out there, and a cold chill came over me, and I thought, oh, God. I go, I get this far, die for walking down the streets with my hands in my pocket. And then again, I sort of got a hold of myself and I said, I think God intervened at that time and sort of comfort, comforted me. And uh, I said, I'll be out of here. I'll be away from all this. So he came out there and he was standing in front of me, just close enough to take that saber and pull it out of his uh, holster and put it up here at my neck. And they asked me, they wanted me to beg and cry, and I wasn't going to do it. All of the POWs was watching. And uh, so I, they said, do you want to say, have a last word? I said, yes, I do. So I looked at that major. I didn't take my eyes off of him, and I said, he can kill me, but he cannot kill my spirit. And my spirit's going to lodge in his body and haunt him until the day he dies. He sort of frowned, but he didn't frown too much. And he said, say it again. And the interpreter said, say it again. And I told him the same thing again. And I said, and there are plenty of Americans coming. And when they get here, if they, if they find out that the Japanese has killed an American, when I just called, they're going to reassure him that the, his, his spirit's going to be lodged in his body and haunted until he dies. He put me in solitary confinement. He pulled his sword back and put me in solitary confinement, a five by five by five hole in the ground. I had a little bit of water in a bottle and one rice ball for seven days and seven nights. 
they thought that would kill me. But I, I just, God didn't, God intervened. Because I didn't know what, I didn't have any idea that I even said that what I said, but it saved my life. I was in a hospital with 28 guys at one time, double pneumonia. First time I had double pneumonia, I didn't have anything. And I think I had to be healed by God because it's bacteria and that just keeps multiplying when you got that pneumonia. But I got well. Second time, they gave me one aspirin. And they came in and said they had a bowl, I mean a bucket of soup, some green water with some kind of vegetables in it. And they were going to give the worst, the first, started the first, given a cup, and go through the 28, and if they had any left, they come back and give a cup more to the, as long as it lasted. So I didn't realize that I was that bad off. So I wound up to be number two in the worst shape. And I, I didn't realize it. And the next day, number one died. Now I'm number one. And the next two days after that, number three died. And I said, oh my God. And so I said, I've got to get out of here. And I was so weak, I could not get up and walk. So I started crawling, and the guys in there said, what are you doing, Frazier? What you, what, what, what's the matter with you? I said, well, I'm getting out of here and going back to work. Mm -hmm. And just about all of them said, yeah, you're going to get out of here in a basket like all of us. Well, I was the only one of that 28 that came out of there alive. The rest of them died. Mm -hmm. I could have laid there, but I was determined that I was going to live, and I had to, I really needed to get up and get out, and I had to do what I had to do to get out there. And I was sick when I got out there, but I, I got well. Mm 